Welcome. My name is William Messacar. I am a Master Model Railroader in the 4th Division of the Pacific Northwest Region of the National Model Railroad Association. And I want to welcome all of you to the virtual layout tour uh, we'll have presented today by members of the NMRA. Um, we would encourage you to find out uh, about the NMRA and join uh, in order to participate in these virtual tours. We have other virtual clinics and other activities for the National Model Railroad Association that we think you'll find uh, a big help to your modeling and you'll get to meet model railroaders just like you. So welcome to our tour and I hope you enjoy it. Many of you have seen my layout, you know that it is a logging theme. And so I wanted to present tonight some of the elements of logging that I tried to incorporate in my layout in its design for operation as well as the uh, selection of scenes to model and how they're located with respect to one another. So I'm sure a lot of you have an idea about logging and so on, but I have a suspicion that a lot of people think, well, what's so interesting about logs? You put them on a rail car and haul them to the sawmill and that's the end of it. Well, uh, not quite. Uh, on my little layout, uh, which is uh, in a room uh, 19 by 16 with an addition, uh, one additional leg, uh, I can operate six trains at a time. And um, it's plenty busy, particularly at two places where trains will often collect and meet. And usually there's room for two, but sometimes we've had three and four. That's always interesting. But in any case, I want to demonstrate a little bit about logging as a general theme and what elements you can easily incorporate in your layout. So here we go. I'm going to show you my layout plan, the arrangement of it, and then I'm going to do a video which um, describes my layout. And then I'm going to talk about some of the elements that you have seen on, on, the, uh, on the video. <clears throat> Cold Creek Lumber Company. So this is my, uh, it's a bonus room above a three car garage. And uh, this is a stairway that comes downstairs to the bonus room. And then over here is a access out to the upstairs hallway where the bedrooms are. And normally in an operating session, this is closed. It's only really an emergency exit. But the layout's pretty simple. It's a point to point layout. Here's a, a fiddle yard. Um, or a staging yard, if you please, uh, which represents the outside world. In this case, the little town of Morton, Washington. Come into Colt Creek, which is my main town. Colt Creek exists to support the logging mill, which is right here at, uh, and this is a bay window that is seven by three, so to give you an idea of the size of this. Comes around the corner, starts upgrade past uh, Lake Johnston. There's an ice house here. Comes to a place called Bunkers. Bunkers is a location of several uh, mines, and you have car loading at two locations here, one here at Hamilton and one here at Ellerby Mines. At the Y here, there's a uh, section that branches off to the little town of Mineral, and there's another mine here, consolidated mines, and then several support buildings and activities that relate to the mining in this area. Come on the other leg of the Y, you go along the stairway and up around to another Y, and then this is the end of the line at Tiger Mountain. Tiger Mountain is where the logs are collected on cars that are loaded in the cutting areas. So they'll put together a train of, of log cars, and that train comes down to the mill, through bunkers, over to the mill, swaps out the, the loads for empties, brings <laughs> empties back up. And that's described as a turn. And then normal operation that takes about an hour and a half with a crew of two, or, although one guy can operate the, the train by himself. So any comments or questions about the, uh, the layout itself? Just for reference, the height of this is like 45 inches. And then up at the top, it's uh, 58 inches high. So there is a significant grade. This is about a 2% grade up to bunkers. And then up along the stairway, this is a 4.25% grade. And you'll be able to see that in the video. Tell them what your scale is. It's SN3, uh, S scale, narrow gauge.
the uh, log train is now ready to depart uh, for the mill and uh, we'll pass some of the structures associated with Tiger Mountain. See the speeder shed. And behind that are two reefers that are at the uh, commissary building. Here's the dispatch and office at Tiger Mountain. Those are tree stumps from the uh, area when they first got in there. And can you, you see the, the Can you turn down the volume a little bit more? Sure. And we'll pass the stock pens at the Y. The stock pens are for sheep that are brought up in the spring and uh, graze up in the upper meadows. And then they uh, are collected at the end of the season and taken back down below. My wife is a knitter, and that's why I have to have sheep on the layout. <laughs> the backdrop is blended in there by a young artist locally who did all of my backdrops. This is along the stairway. And uh, that's a scale 900 feet down to the landing. In the, the real world, it's about eight feet. So the train is approaching bunkers. There's the Y here. One leg will lead us into bunkers. The other leg off to the right would lead us into the town of Pinero. This is a 37 ton Shea. pass under, under a bridge structure that carries tracks over to Ellerby Mines. The rock castings on the right are plaster and on the left are the two-part epoxy, both using ragged and molds. So here we are at one leg of the line at bunkers. Number 12 is a three-truck Climax, and you can see behind it, number 10, the elements of the switchback that go up to all the mines and hammock. The cars are brought up from Cold Creek to bunkers and left here in the yard for distribution in the town of Mineral or up to the mines. Generally, when the loads are taken out, the uh, trains are assembled here again to go back down to Cold Creek. The logs are butterfly bush. Skeleton cars on the west side were hand-me-downs were purchased from the Swain Lumber Company. The bridge is crossing the river that feeds Lake Johnston. Lake Johnston, there is a dock set up where they cut ice blocks in the winter and the lake's frozen over. And the blocks are stored in a ice house for use in the summer uh, by various locations on the uh, logging setup. 
Lake Johnston is a pretty good fishing spot. We've got a couple of guys here hoping to find a trout or two. The fishing pole, by the way, is a white whisker from one of, one of my cats. The dam here that creates uh, Lake Johnston is there to regulate the water flowing into the log pond. Here's the ice house. There's still some detail to be done here with the mechanism for loading the ice up into the various levels of storage. That's a totally scratch built structure. With individual boards actually. And you can see a stump or two here from the original growth in the area was logged. We're approaching the log pond. There's a water tank here that uh, any train going upgrade needs to stop and, and be sure that tender uh, water is stopped off. See the uh, beginning of the log dump track. The loads will be pulled into a siding here and swapped out for the empties. And then the locomotive will take the empties back up and drag them out. In the background, you can see at the log dump the elements, which include an A frame for helping unload the logs. Rowlog, which is uh, there to protect the vessel from the heavy logs that are unloaded as they drop onto the structure. Underneath that is a lockout problem, similar to the location that I used as an idea for modeling this, the English Bay Logging Company up in Skagit County. That's the dispatch office for trains going up to Tiger Mountain. And you see the check or the dam that was built to create the log pond there. It's designed in such a way that the uh, level can be changed at the end of the season or during the season by lifting the individual boards out of the, uh, the spillway there. In the background, you can see the elements of the mill, uh, the green chain with the lumber stacked on it. Behind it is a dry storage area under a, uh, uh, a roofed building and one of the Heislers that uh, works to switch cars at the mill. See if this works. So with regard to um, a logging operation, um, we talk about the cutting of the timber, the hauling it by uh, rail to the mill, and then I want to describe various ways of loading it with log booms and loaders. There's a boom called a heel boom. We moved the logs on different kinds of rail cars. There's flat cars, which was the original way they did it when the logs were very short, but very heavy. Skeleton cars, which are basically just a center beam and the trucks at each end with uh, bunks that uh, hold the logs on. Then there's log bunks, which are flat cars with steel structures on them that contain the logs. There are disconnects where at each end of a long set of logs, there is a set of trucks that are usually chained uh, to the ends of the logs. So there's nothing connecting the two sets of trucks together. At, uh, when you unload them, you unload them at a log dump. At the log dump, there's a thing called a brow log. The logs are pulled off of the cars with either an A-frame, which puts a cable underneath the logs and lifts them up off the car, or what's called a jill poke, which is a device that as the car moves past it, it pokes the logs off. And then there are all kinds of mechanical unloaders in the log pond, the ponds were designed basically to let the people move the logs around easily, but mostly it was a way of getting the dirt and rocks and stuff that got on the logs when they were being pulled to the sorting areas and loading areas. The, most of that stuff would fall to the bottom of the pond. 
Some were not <clears throat> set up that way, but they were set up with what's called a dry landing, which would be a, a set of logs laid next to each other. And then the logs were moved around with cable and just manhandled into place with the uh, PVs and, and other uh, pry bars. At the mill, you had the jack slip, which loaded the logs up out of the water into the sawmill. Inside the <coughs> sawmill, there'd be circular saws or a bandsaw or a series of bandsaws. You have all kinds of equipment in there to, to shape the lumber as edgers and planers. When the lumber was finished inside the mill, it was pushed out one end or side onto what was called a green chain. And the green chain is where they sorted the logs or the tum timber, now the cut lumber, by quality and size. They graded it there and then decided uh, they would load it into, uh, sack it into piles. There the uh, <laughs> cut lumber would be either loaded aboard rail cars for shipment out, or they were kept on site for air drying, and sometimes material would be dried depending on the location. California was different than Washington State, so California and other more arid climates, they used an awful lot of outside air drying. Washington State, they would put the cut lumber into dry kilns, and there through uh, steam and heat, they would reduce the moisture content of the lumber. The associated buildings with a logging setup would include a boiler house, bunk houses, a commissary, an ice house, perhaps. You'd have a cookhouse uh, and a kitchen. Engine facilities would include repair sheds, blacksmith shop. There's this, always a saw, a saw filing structure somewhere on the premises. You'd have a dispatch office, water tanks, speeder sheds, hospital. And then, of course, in the locomotives, you had all kinds of uh, locomotives. We'll see several examples of those at camp cars, which were residences on wheels. You'd have coaches, often they were recycled suburban electric cars uh, and other passenger cars from railroads that weren't uh, using them in first class service. They would end up in logging lines and that's where they hauled the crews up to the, from the mill up to the uh, cutting areas on a daily basis or sometimes on a weekly basis. Speeders, which were small little motorized units that they used to carry supplies uh, maintain the line and sometimes those would serve as the ambulance. Work trains, you needed uh, derrick, pile drivers, cars loaded with ties and rails and other supplies, bunk cars and water cars. Many of the log lines were ballasted, some weren't, but you'd have ballast cars which dumped gravel in the center line of the track and then it was spread uh, amongst the ties. There would often be a drag line at a stream or uh, nearby where they would build a short spur and then load gravel right out of the stream onto uh, the ballast car. Uh, such things as ditchers, you had motorized uh, steam shovels, a thing called a Clyde track layer, which was a big mechanism that enabled them to lay track pretty fast. It carried the ties and the rails together with an overhead trolley that moved the things out ahead of the, the construction of the track and then that unit would just roll forward. You'd have tank cars, refrigerator cars, tool cars. You'd have uh, all kinds of machines like donkeys, yarders, and loaders, and, and the bulldozers. Those would be loaded onto and moved around on what were called moving cars. Those are typically heavy duty flat cars with steel decks. So are there any questions at all? How long have you been building this? How, how many years? I, start, I started it in 2002 and uh, had, the, uh, had the track work all done for uh, the convention in 2004. Yeah. That, and then uh, after that, I built the, uh, the segment to uh, Morton, which is the fiddle yard. It got permission to cut through the wall and uh, that cost me a lot. And then uh, about six years ago, seven years ago, I built the, the chunk along the side of the stairs. Actually, I had that done before 2012 for the narrow gauge convention here. And then after that, I, in the area where mineral is, there was a big sofa and there was my crew lounge. The only problem was guys would come over and want to sit there and drink beer and not run trains. So I took the sofa out and I built a little L that's six feet on a side, uh, which added an awful lot to the, to the layout operation. There's, uh, five different locations there where you can move cars. So again, my theory here was to have everything on the layout relate to some practice that was legitimate and reasonable. So there's an awful lot of movement of cars amongst industries and locations on the layout. And then there are movements of cars, loads going out to Morton on a train that leaves at the end of the day. 
and then cars come in from Morton at the beginning of the day, and that would include new merchandise, new machine parts, other materials that are used by the citizens and so on. So it justifies fully, like I say, six trains each operating session, and many of them are running at the same time. Session takes about two hours. That's enough for, for old guys to stand up. And by that time, we're ready for lunch. Russ, right. your, your video just showed uh, the logging trains themselves, but your listing in your PowerPoint uh, showed so many trains that were taking people and supplies up to the camps. Do you run those during your operating sessions? Yes. A uh, typical session, a train would start at Tiger Mountain, log train would come down, but there'd be two also operators at Mineral moving cars from the mines to consolidate them into trains, and then there's other merchandise there. But let me bring back the, uh, well, here's Mineral. And so I've got um, a fuel dealer here, a supply house here, warehouse here, the mines and the bunkers right here. There's a depot here. And there's also a, a, a team track. So like I say, there's five industries here where I can switch cars. But a train would be made up here and that train comes down into Coal Creek and it uh, then picks up loads and, and empties and goes back to the mines. So that is also a turn. And then at the, the same time, this log train is coming down and you recognize that it's gonna pass the activity here while these guys are switching these cars. Another train is made up at Coal Creek and it stops along the way at the mill and on up here at Bunkers. It may leave a couple of cars here at uh, the yard at Bunkers and then go on up to Tiger Mountain. And up at Tiger Mountain, there's the stores building, the commissary, there's a, a repair shed for cars, there's a, a loading dock and a facility where the bulldozers and other equipment are loaded and unloaded and serviced. So uh, that's another train. And then there's a, a final train that works at the mill and that is the mill turn. And it uh, can either start at Coal Creek or start at the mill, depending on how, how many operators I have. But if uh, this would be loads coming out to Coal Creek and then empties going back into the mill and that uh, turn also moves cars around amongst the locations at the mill. For instance, lumber that comes out of the mill uh, would be moved from the loading dock at the side of the mill and then switched into this dry storage track. And that in and of itself takes a little while to get things out of the way. There's also a spur track here for fuel oil that is used to power the mill. And that's a tank car usually every day that is left there. There's a movement that picks or leaves up reefers here at the ice house. So there's, yes, there's quite a bit of activity. And then if you really want to throw in a, a ringer, like for uh, Sound Rails a couple of years ago, an extra guy showed up and <laughs> it was Bill Banta actually, uh, Bantle Models. And so I gave him a passenger, uh, no, a work train. And he ran the work train from Morton all the way up to the top and got in everybody's way. And it was kind of fun to watch. Uh, you can also run a passenger train with crew going up from, uh, from Coal Creek up to Tiger Mountain for the cutting areas. And one of the, uh, and often many of the trains are mixed trains. And so they, they would, when they get to the depot here at Mineral, the uh, combine, which is part of that train, would be have to park it at the depot while they were doing all of the other movements and then pick it up as they left town. So you can force an awful lot of list of activities for the operators. Russ, uh, this is Bill Messicar. Why don't you mention the method you use for car forwarding? What's your system? A good friend of ours, uh, Bill and I are both using the same system generated locally by Bruce Hanley. It's called Rail Ops, and it's available free for anybody that wants to tackle it. It generates the switch lists automatically from the cars that I have in the database. It remembers where every car is if it's properly moved. It schedules the trains and so on. So that at the end of the day, it knows where the cars were left. And then the beginning of the next session generates a new bunch of switch lists. But it's a great system because you can make modifications on the fly. And the computer remembers all of that. If you uh, add cars or, or take cars out of the train uh, that were not in the original daily be, uh, setup of the switch list. Bill's been using it for a couple of years. I've, I've been using it since, it's, since he created it about five, six years ago. So one other thing, I realized after a while that you need a proper complement of cars on the layout. 
I think I have something like 40 cars on my layout. Any more than that, it gets a little clogged up. It's always interesting to see guys' layouts where every track has got a car on it. But in the real world, an awful lot of tracks got nothing on it. And you always want to leave maneuvering room in a yard or in an industry location because you what just will need it. What was the name of the program again? It's called Rail Ops or ROPS, R-O-P-P-S. If you could do it again, uh, what would you change? Actually, not a whole lot. One of the things is I realized after a while that this is sort of an ideal size. It's not too big. It's not too small. It can easily be fun just for one guy, mm -hmm. or you can accommodate, like I say, six or so operators. Any bigger than this is a lot of stuff to maintain, as Burr knows. And again, you just have to realize your limitations, at least mine. Oh, one other thing I want to point out, if you look at it, all of these locations, like here in the yard, where the engine house turntable are, here at uh, Chambers Industries, here at the mill, the ice house, Hamilton, Ellerby Mines, and then Mineral and Tiger Mountain, all of those are locations that you can't see except when you're looking at them. So the idea is you don't want to look through a scene into another scene. And Lee, you, you know, you, you're tuned into this. I, I wanted to have just an, as reasonably uncluttered a scene as possible. The other thing is to limit the number of structures on the bill, on the on the layout. The circumstances are that in S scale, the structures get really big, real fast. Like this mill, this is over 30 inches long and uh, about 12 inches wide. The main structure is 12 by like 32, big and bulky. I run an NCE system. I'm very happy with it. It's radio controlled been flawless in its operation. The only other thing I might mention, and uh, you see this doorway here? Well, across here is a spare bedroom. When our son moved off, did the college and so on, I thought, boy, what a great spot to expand. Because I could just go right around the corner here into that other room. But no, it's not happening. Anyway, I, I'm, the other thing that's nice is if you're lucky, you, you've got an air-conditioned space. This one is. So there's limited dust and limited temperature change and, and humidity change. Those are the enemies of a layout. One of the other issues was, uh, and I can talk about this on my layout tour, is lighting. Initially, I put track lighting all along here, all the way around. I ended up with three circuits. Uh, each one uh, was uh, about 14 amp, 1400 amps, watts rather. So in the room, I had uh, over 3000 watts of heat. And if you get, for an open house, you get uh, eight or nine guys up there, it got plenty hot, even with air conditioning. That was with incandescent bulbs. So then fortunately along came the LEDs and I've changed that all out, which makes it tolerable. But that's, those are issues. Russ, this is Bill again. One, th one thing I picked up from Russ from operating on his layout, uh, he mentioned the program that creates a switch list, RR Ops or Railroad Operations, and it prints an eight and a half by 11 sheet or sheets, and you put it on a full-size clipboard. And what he had done and what I've done now is he had a Velcro pad about the size of, I don't know, three inches in diameter on the back of that and another one on the fascia of his layout he can just stick that thing with the switch list on it anywhere he wants on the layout and you don't put it on top of the layout. I thought that was very ingenious and I do that now on mine. Uh, you just get done with it, just stick it in front of the layout and do something else. I also put Velcro on the back of the, uh, the train controllers and I can just stick those on one of those pads on the layout fascia. And so you can hang it there, basically. And I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I operate, typically I put it set up so uh, the speed is like six to seven miles an hour for a train in a switching environment. And I'll just use the reverse direction key to start and stop the train in switching moves. And you just leave the, uh, the power at the same setting. So that, in that regard, you have to tune your locomotives to make sure that they don't have a whole bunch of uh, momentum in them. Or it takes forever to switch. Have you uh, played around with the uh, with like lighting and electronics in any of your stuff? Like, ha have you started looking into animating pieces of it? I have not. I know a lot of people do. They well, they've got the LEDs that are programmable, 
the Chooch, Michael Connell, with his uh, Proto 48 layout, is configured in such a way that he can do from dusk to dawn or dawn to dusk with the lighting values, and they change throughout the day. And then it's got a night light feature, which is incredibly pretty and effective. But others, uh, you mentioned animation. There are a number of guys who do animation of one kind or another. If you, uh, are you familiar with Laurie McLean? Laurie is an, uh, he's a fellow down in Australia who's done some incredible things with animation. Like it has a, an engine, this is an HO. He's got the engineer who, who head swivels as he looks back if the engine's backing up and then it swivels forward if the train's moving forward. The brakeman in the back of the caboose, he's swinging the lantern. But look him up online and on, on YouTube, Laurie McLean. We're going to sign off and um, please keep in touch. And um, good night, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. All right. Take care. Good night, everybody. Thanks, for Thanks, Lisa. All righty. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Hello again. Um, this is a, another reminder that this uh, virtual layout tour has been brought to you by members of the 4th Division of the Pacific Northwest Region of the National Model Railroad Association. And we hope you've enjoyed it, and we want to encourage you to, again, find out about the NMRA online. Uh, both PNR and NMRA have an excellent website where you can get information about joining and participating in this and other activities like our our uh, uh, clinics that are held all over the region. So thank you for joining us today and great wish you great modeling.